everybody. Good to see all your faces. I just went down and saw Joyce Jesso chewing her lunch. Um, I want to tell you all a little bit about Sue Walsh. While she may be short in length, she's definitely not short in knowledge about plants and animals in, on the peninsula. But of course, we all know that, right? Right. When you, what you may not know is that she moved to PV in 1997. Since then, her quest for knowledge has taken her to be involved with the Marine Mammal Care Center, Los Serenos, and the Land Conservancy, all of which have taught her a lot. Today, she will share her knowledge of plants with us. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. I've chosen to focus today on our native plants, a few selected ones, and our areas. Whoops. Oh, mercy. Just a moment. It's something. Uh, it's not going to. Uh, it's not going to advance. Okay, hold on. I think I've been on this for too long. Uh, be back in a moment. That didn't work. Nope, it's not advancing. Okay. Oh. So no, no, okay. try it. Try it now. Click here. And now click again. There we go. Sorry. I'm, so we're gonna. I'm gonna focus on Chadwick Canyon Trail as well as the Lanada Bay Native Plant Garden, since we had such a nice tour of the Point Vicente Native Plant Garden with Megan Wolf uh, a few weeks ago. So hopefully we'll start with our Catalina cherry. It's probably my absolute favorite. And we see a lot of this, uh, especially as you go up the, the Chadwick Trail. The Chadwick Trail is accessed off Palos Verdes Drive North, just southwest of the intersection with Crenshaw. And you start up the horse trail and then it it veers off towards the left to go up the Chadwick Trail and following it will take you all the way to the back of Chadwick School. So we see our Catalina cherry. Um, the Catalina cherry was used by the Native Americans. They ate the fruit. They would then take the seeds and um, leach them in warm water to get out the little bit of toxin that was in them, then dry them and grind them up to use them in uh, mush if they wanted to. It's a favorite gnawing plant for squirrels and possums and other rodents that have to keep their teeth gr ground down. Lovely cherry tree. And this year it was, they were loaded with cherries. It was a wonderful blossoming year. Another um, lovely food for munching and eating is the elderberry. Um, the, the picture on the left, shows the trees as they look. They grow quite tall. And at this time of year, they're quite airy looking. They're not very dense in their growth. Um, also at this time of year, it's a time of year when Native Americans, the picture on the top right shows you some of the twigs and sticks and branches, how straight they are. Mute, did I get muted? Anyway. Um, the branches would make wonderful shafts for arrows. They also would use the larger parts of the branches, so possibly along in here and in here. They could be hollowed out to make flutes. Uh, they made clapper sticks with them, so they often called this the music tree. As to the elderberries, this is what they look like right now. So they're kind of a, in the middle of a, a blooming, blossoming season. A lot of them have been already chewed off by various critters and birds. A ripe clump of berries would look like that. And the berries are edible. However, on this, this is the uh, Sambucus nigra or black elderberry. And you really don't want to eat a whole lot of these unless they've been cooked, whether they've been cooked boiled or cooked in a pie or made into syrup, something like that, then they're perfectly fine. But eating them raw, they act as um, a diuretic and a laxative. 
So those effects can be very uncomfortable for people. Oh, it's doing it again. Sorry, there we go. Uh, blackberries. Uh, if you're going up the Chadwick Canyon, a lot of us, the local people call it the Blackberry Trail. It is loaded with back blackberries. And even at this time of year, we still have ripe blackberries coming up. The name Rubus Ursinus is kind of fun. Ursinus, of course, means life by the bears. So when the botanists named the native California blackberries, they noticed that it was a favorite of the bears. So that's what gives it its lovely name. The other thing in this picture, you can see it has a leaflet of three and there the little uh, line is leaflet of three, let it be. It's very similar looking to poison oak and it often grows in the same areas as poison oak. However, you can see up here that this blackberry has lots of thorns and of course most of us have picked them so we know that they are full of thorns. Um, that's a difference between this and poison oak. The poison oak has very smooth branches, making it very attractive to picking, but of course we don't want to do that. Okay, so our lovely blackberry. Our next berry is our lemonade berry. And going up Chadwick Trail, the lemonade berries are practically trees. They're huge. Uh, they're blooming, uh, or I shouldn't say blooming, they're in fruit at this time of year. So they are covered with these lovely berries that have that very gooey, sticky um, coating on the outside that's sweet, tart tasting. Uh, that which uh, legend has it, people made lemonade back in the day with it. I know today the hikers sometimes put it in their water bottles. And I did too, till Holly Gray from the Land Conservancy told me that they have little psyllids on them, on those berries, little tiny insects that live in the goo. And I thought, I don't think I need those in my water bottle anymore. Anyway, the blossoms here, we can see the, the blossom. This is the female blossom. It's gonna have the berries on it. The males of this lemonade berry have a whitish looking blossom. And the way we kind of know which is which is if you look at the bottom of the plant, you can see a whole bunch of the blossoms, they fall off as soon as uh, insects have taken the pollen out of the male blossoms. The female blossoms will stay on the branch until they become the berries. Our next berry is Toyon, also huge growing as you go up the, the Chadwick Trail. We see this some of the other places here all over Palos Verdes. Toyon, of course, is often called the Christmas berry or the Hollywood berry, a California holly. Those are all names for it. It covered the Hollywood Hills, so that's where it got that nickname. Um, it has lots of berries on it. The berries, when they're ripe, turn the nice bright red color. They are edible if they are dried or heated up to get rid of the toxin in them. The native people would dry them and eat them that way when the, after they were re, uh, fully ripe, or they would cook them and then dry them and grind them up. They are favorite foods of birds. The birds seem to know not to pick the green berries, which have the, um, I guess it's called high, hydrocyanic acid or kind of like a cyanide in them. Uh, the leaves are serrated, uh, which helps keep uh, predators away from the plants and the berries. And mule fat. Mule fat grows pretty much like in the um, riparian areas of the trail. In other words, the edges of the creek that runs down there, just a little trickle at this time of year. In February or March, it will actually make, have enough water in it so you can hear it. But this mule fat loves to grow in air. It grows in areas too where there are willows. The mule fat uh, was a favorite food for cattle and horses in the ranching days in, in Palos Verdes and back to the Spanish days. When you look at the leaves, uh, you can note that the leaves of a mule fat have three 
main veins that you can see. There's a main one going up the center and then one on either side. And that's one way of knowing mule fat. Also the blossom heads on mule fat in a clump like this, whereas willows, they make kind of a, a little catkin that kind of hangs off of the plant. So lovely mule fat. And wild cucumbers. A number of people ask what these are. They hang all over the trees and shrubs. At this time of year, they're very brown. They have the dried seed pods hanging on them. The leaves are all gone. As soon as we get a little bit of rain, they will shoot out their new leaves, new plants, new vines, and they will produce very quickly within a week, they will start producing their lovely little flowers, which then within another week, they will start producing the pods. They're very quick as a native plant to reproduce their pods so they can continue to grow. And inside the pod are these little brown seeds. The seeds are toxic. So um, the Native Americans knew that and they would take these seeds and grind them up and then sprinkle them on streams or in little areas where there might be fish gathering in a pond um, on our little streams here in Palos Verdes. And that the powder from that had the toxin in them that would stupefy the fish. They would kind of float to the surface so they were very easy to scoop up. Then in cooking the fish, it got rid of any toxins that might have been carried on in the digestive systems of the fish. So they really knew how to handle them. They also made decorative jewelry and things out of these seeds. They're about the size of a marble. And we certainly don't want to eat them. Uh, there are, would be toxic to people. Like four or five of these seeds um, would do you in for sure. And our yucca. Our yucca is a lovely native plant. Likes lots of sunshine. The blossoms are edible and a lot of people will, if they're down low enough, they will harvest all these blossoms. Um, the, the plant itself was used by the Native Americans for um, cordage. You can take the leaves and sh shred them apart and make cordage. The very tip of it makes a nice needle. So if you've got a piece of the the fibers from it attached on that needle, you're all ready to go for sewing up the sandals that you might like to make out of the cordage. Some years ago, we had a docent with, point, uh, with the Los Serenos that showed me how to make sandals. And she actually made a pair of little sandals that you could put on your feet out of the yucca leaves. Oh, it's absolutely amazing. Anyway, um, so, some people have actually used the gentle, the new shoots of the leaves to eat. They are edible. The uh, birds love it and nest in it. And it's uh, one of our desert plants that we see in our, in our coastal sage scrub habitat. This particular one though is actually over on the edge of the Lunana Bay native plant garden and it's quite a stand of yucca. And so that say, being said, we have our native plant garden and Lunata Canyon. The picture on the top left shows looking up Lunata Canyon from the end of Paseo Lunata. And this was taken actually in the springtime when the mustard and fennel are just beginning to grow on the hills there was enough water in the creek so that everything was nice and green. Um, we can see our little grove of mule fat here. And we're gonna then talk about some of these other plants uh, and this area as we go along a little bit later. Willow is growing over here. On this uh, picture, we're gonna look at it a little bit bigger. Uh, it shows, it's the bottom end of the creek. So if you turned around and walk back down towards the bluffs down Lunata Canyon, this is at the lower end of the same canyon. Different looking habitat for sure. And the bottom picture is a panoramic view of that 
relatively new native plant garden there at Lanata Bay. And this is a blow up. I like this picture because it shows the creek bed where it has been left to grow kind of natural. This time of year, this is the kind of pond that is there. And we have the tulies and the reeds that the Native Americans, the Tongva, would have made their houses out of, like the sample of which we have in Point Pisani. They would have bundled these, gathered these reeds, tulies uh, together, and used cordage that would be made from this um, stinging nettle. So this, this little plant has come up and it's been left alone, which is marvelous. Most people pull it out. The stinging nettle would be, uh, have uh, strings made out of it, and then it would be woven together or braided to use to tie the bundles together and attach them to willow. And here is our willow. And the willow has the nice, soft, flexible branches that made really good shaping material for the structure of the houses that the, in our area, that the Tonga would be building. Um, we think of it, I think of this area since there were two villages, uh, Tove Munga and Chawinya. Chawinya, they have found artifacts from in the Malaga Cove dunes area. This is a, a little bit further north in Palisades from the native plant garden. But the willows are, were very important. One of the things on the willows we can find are the sawfly, here's a sawfly, galls. The sawfly burrows into the leaves on the willow and lays their eggs. And as the eggs hatch, they form these big uh, galls as they're eating the willow tree. They seem to have a symbiotic relationship. They don't, there's not enough of them to kill the willows, but they're rather interesting to see. And of course, the willows are the source. They were the source of well, the medicines for the Native Americans. They would chew on the leaves, the leaves and that had uh, salicylic acid in them, which is um, aspirin. And it was used for all kinds of aches, everything from headaches to stomach aches to stub toes. So it's a very versatile plant. Sue? Yes, ma'am. We have a question. In the yes. previous slide, we had some water flowing. Where does that water come from? This water is from the, the head, uh, it's up the very top of Chadwick Canyon is, is the creek that comes down through there. And very you... top. And actually the very top of Chadwick Canyon crosses underneath the road across the street from Ralph's at the top of the hill. And you could continue and go on up it. And I suspect at the very top of the hill, there is some kind of a spring, but also there's probably collected watering waters that come out through the ground soils from people watering their properties that collects and forms in that creek. And of course and can, then, yes? Can you give us um, just a little bit uh, directions on how to get to Chadwick Canyon, the trail, in case people don't know how to get there? Chadwick Canyon is on the southwest corner of Palos Verdes Drive North and Crenshaw Boulevard. You would park in the parking lot that's for, um, behind the buildings that are there. I think they're educational buildings, uh, tutoring and language skill buildings. And I, there may even be some legal and medical offices in the buildings. Park back there, walk over to the, on PV Drive North to the horse trail and go right up the horse trail to the Chadwick Canyon Trail. Is, does that answer whoever's question, I hope? Sherry? Uh, yes, I had, yeah, I had no idea where it was. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, and so our coastal sage scrub habitat, uh, this, this is absolutely gorgeous. This is the, this time of year, it looks so beautiful. So we have our coyote brush, buckwheat, coyote brush, sage brush, in our California bush sunflowers, and a, one of the bunch grasses, a needle grass that we call deer weed, or excuse me, deer grass. And this is the, one of the plants that was used by the Native Americans for their basket weaving. 
And we have some samples of those baskets that we look at when we're talking with people on tours. Uh, it's kind of amazing. And I always tell people I was amazed to see in the Southwest Museum of the Native American Indians and then in a, um, a changing exhibit in the American, uh, the Native American Museum, but it's part of the Smithsonian, they have for the Gabrielina Tongva baskets. That's what they are remembered for, is the baskets that would be woven so tight from this deer grass that they would hold water. That sagebrush, here we are with the sagebrush. And of course, we all know that the Native Americans used it with that sweet smell as a smudge to hide their scents. They would put it in their houses to crush, to walk on, to sleep on, to smell good, as well as to keep away insects, particularly fleas and mosquitoes, other pesky uh, insects. It does rub off on you. All you have to do is rub your hand on the plant and you can smell the plant. Uh, gives it its name cowboy cologne because anybody brushing against it would, would pick up that lovely smell. It's a great habitat for California coastal gnat catchers who like to build their nests in it. The seeds are edible. The tongva would roast the seeds and then mash them and mix them with water to make a very nutritious mush that they would eat. On the right-hand side, we have the spittle bugs, which we can see, see the spittle bugs in the mornings at this time of year, also in the springtime. And then the blow up of what a spittle bug is. The spittle bug, um, especially the, the small ones, will actually create this um, or excrete a liquid that when it hits the air becomes a foam and they that kind of covers them over. They burrow into it. It protects them from the birds that might like to eat them because the birds don't want to get this sticky stuff on their beaks. It's kind of like sticky like marshmallows that have been melted over a campfire and you get it sticky on your hands and you, you either have to lick it off or wash it off. So the ins they don't the birds don't like to mess with this particular insect because of that. Nice sticky spittle. And we have next to that our purple sage. The purple sage at this time of year has these lovely seed pods on it. And this is, these are gnat catchers. And actually these pictures were taken in at Point Vicente in the native plant garden um, a couple weeks ago of the gnat catchers, which was delightful to still see. This was the female, the male could be heard calling her, but we didn't quite find her and she's enjoying some of the seeds and the insects that have come. The insects like to burrow into these seed pods and then the, the birds will go after the insects that are in the seed pods, as well as a little spider called a crab spider that will hide amongst the leaves and then go after the, the insects that have burrowed into the, the seed pods in the purple sage. Also, we have black sage has very dark seed pods, not too many of them at this time of year, much smaller. The black sage, the Latin name is Mellifera, which means honey producing. And you can see in the picture on the left, the plant had a lot of sticky goo on it and it had attracted a lot of small insects and this great big locust that came along and landed while we were looking at it. On the right is a ladybird beetle that would be eating along there. And this honey, this sweet sticky on the black sage would attract aphids, which of course is one of the favorite foods for the, the ladybug. The black sage also has very dark leaves. They will shrivel up and to, uh, provide, to save moisture for the plant. Uh, they will even drop off when it's very dry. When it's spring and wet, they will have very large leaves. The leaves are smooth on the top surface and hairy on the underside. And that hairy side also provides an area where those crab spiders can like to hide so they can get to any of the little insects that come that are attracted to the sticky side on the front of these leaves. Our sea cliff buckwheat. This is our hair streak butterfly. But the one that we are noting at this in the springtime uh, on Seacliff Buckwheat is the El Segundo blue butterfly. 
as with this butterfly, they are really attracted to the flower heads. And the El Segundo blue butterfly actually lays her eggs in one of these flower heads so that when the little larva hatch, the little worms or caterpillars are then ready to feast on the nectar in the, that are in the, um, in the seed pods or the flower heads of the buckwheat. Um, it's, it's also um, bush tits, warblers come and also like to eat the seeds and the insects that are in this plant. So it attracts a lot of things. These are our lizards and the lizards also are attracted to the buckwheat. And the top picture is our side blotched lizard. And we see him, he likes to hide. He has a relatively smooth skin. His body shape is very similar to the Western fence lizard in the lower left-hand picture. Um, only his skin is a little bit smoother than the Western fence lizard. It's not as scaly or the scales on the Western fence lizard have uh, kind of like little points on them. And this guy doesn't. He is named for a side blotch that's unfortunately in my picture, it's in the shade, but it's just under, it's like his under his arm on his front legs. There's a blotch, usually a kind of a reddish orange blotch that can identify him. Um, but he likes to hide. He doesn't like to be out in the sun. So he's not going to be out doing push-ups like the Western fence lizard. On the right hand top side is an alligator lizard. And he too likes to be in the shade. He's not going to be out in the sun much. But this guy was probably looking for a female. There were several of them romping around. And these little guys have a kind of a peculiar behavior that the male in his courtship actually bites the nose of the female and hangs on for a little while, which reminds me of our sea otters that do the same kind of thing. The male bites the nose of the female. It's kind of random, randomly strange. In this picture we see here is the Western fence lizard. And while we were watching, he decided he was gonna climb up through the buckwheat. And here he is sitting on this branch and he's going after some insects that were up. And this is his happy little face after he was able to capture and eat one of the insects out of the, the buckwheat. And he's, it's kind of an unusual pose for him to be hanging on this branch. But I just, I thought it was really fun. Ah, our rattle pod or astragalus or loco weed or milk fetch. And I, it's delightful to see some of this plant coming back in our native plant gardens. Um, in hiking with kids through with the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy, and we talk about rattle pod and blue butterflies, we often give them some dried seeds out of these seed pods that they can sprinkle on the trail. So they're helping to, to save the plants and reintroduce them to areas where they had been. Um, the loco weed is actually toxic to animals and to people. So you don't want to be eating a lot of it. It would make you sick. Um, it has a neurotoxin in it and cattle that ate it became kind of disoriented. Uh, some people would describe it as crazy because they're usually very good followers, but they would wander where they didn't belong. So it got the name loco weed among the, the Spanish ranchers and that name stuck. And a lot of areas where people do ranch cattle or sheep or goats, they do remove the rattle pod, which was a problem here in Palos Verdes, pulling it all out, then we all lost our blue butterfly habitat. And it provides the plant, the but blue butterfly will lay her eggs on the seed pods of the rattle pod. And as soon as the larva hatch, they burrow into the seed pod and eat the seed material. And that's what they survive in. And when they are full with that, then they will burrow back out of the seed pod and crawl down into the ground to lay their, to make their uh, chrysalis or cocoon and then hatch into our lovely little blue butterfly. The other plant that often gets mixed up with the rattle pod is bladder pod. And the names are of course very similar, but plants are very different. 
the bladders uh, hang individually on the bladder pod, whereas on the loco weed, they're on a stem all together. The bladder pod has these lovely large yellow flowers, which are edible. The bladders are edible when they're nice and, and young and tender. When they start to get dried out, they get very woody or, and nasty tasting. The leaves are edible, the stems, the roots, all of this plant is edible. The Native Americans ate it. Um, I find it has kind of a bitter taste. Uh, I'm, I'm not fond of eating it. It also is home for our little harlequin bugs and they will spend their whole lives on bladder pod. They will lay their eggs on the bladders. The eggs will, they look like two barrels, side by side, little tiny barrels with little stripes on them. And when those hatch, they will burrow into the bladders and again, eat the seed material and then burrow back out of it when they're a little bit lar larger and they will then crawl through the plant. They are a sucking insect. So they are going to suck the juices out of the leaves on the plant. And they are very attractive to birds and critters. Probably that those uh, little Western fence lizards would love to climb up in one of these plants and eat. Their defense mechanism is to minutes they feel the leaves moving, they will drop down through the plant to the ground and work their way into the center of the plant that way. So that's one way that they can survive. And we have our prickly pear. In Palos Verdes, we have three prickly pears. The first two uh, have the spines on them. The one on the far left, it has the nice red um, fruit on it called tuna. They are, are edible, sweet, have a sweet sour taste to them, kind of like pomegranate. When you cut them open, you can scoop out the inside and eat it like you're eating a kiwi. Or it could be if you used something either, uh, some people use a lighter, uh, the tongva would use sticks, you brush off the spines and then cook it, boil it. You can get a syrup out of it, nice syrup to, that could be used on buckwheat pancakes. Um, the spines would be brushed off with sticks by the tongva. And this, this particular plant that we have a picture of, you can see people have been cutting off the, the red fruits, the tunas, as soon as they get ripe. They're, they're very popular. And these are in our native plant gardens are very accessible to people walking by and they seem to not be able to resist cutting off the fruits. The middle one is what we call our golden spined cactus. This one's in, of course, in the native plant garden there in Lunata Bay. Some people call this pancake uh, cactus because of the shape of the round pads on it. And it is edible. It could be cooked in a frying pan it's to cook off the outer layer and the needles. Um, as long as you get rid of the needles, it's completely edible, all parts of it. And something interesting about the cacti, um, the, the pads are actually the stems and the branches. The needles are the leaves on the cacti. And when there's lots of water, there will be a lot of leaves or a lot of needles. And when there's not much water, the needles become sharper, smaller, and dried out. So we, you know, it's, it's an adaptable plant as well. The needles, of course, keep predators from bothering the plant, chewing on it. Um, the cactus wren, of course, loves to make her nest in it. The third one we have is being grown a lot in Palos Verdes now agriculturally. And this, this is the spineless prickly pear. It was high, one of these varieties, and I believe this is the one, was uh, hybridized by Luther Burbank between 1907 and 1925 to use, and he wanted these spineless cacti to use as food for cattle and sheep and goats. And I, I found it very interesting in talking with my dad about this when I said something about the spineless cacti, his first comment was, oh, those are the ones that they bred that the cattle could eat. And I was amazed because I had no idea. But anyway, so we do have some of these. Um, they are, have been introduced to Palos Verdes. 
and the areas where they're growing them, they want to harvest the pads and the blossoms. You can actually buy the blossoms sometimes in the farmer's market. I've seen them occasionally. They're really good. And of course, then when the fruit is ripe, it's wonderful as well. And our milkweed. It's also good to see the, lots of the milkweed coming. This is the native milkweed that has the very long leaves on it or long leaf milkweed. It is um, the home for uh, the monarch butterfly. She will lay her eggs on this. And when the caterpillars hatch, they will eat the leaves. They will just devour the plants. This plant is distinguished from the tropical milkweed, which some of us have, that have the orange and reddish flowers on it and a little bit broader leaves. The, the, actually, the butterflies like to eat that, maybe even a little bit better than the native milkweed, and, but it um, somehow it allows the butterflies to, to be um, affected by a bacteria that then when they make their um, chrysalis, the larva or the caterpillar does not, it dies, it does not hatch. And we had that happen in our yard this year. It was a rather surprising outcome from the, the tropical milkweed, but it's the nice, nice to see the good milkweed coming. Um, milkweed that it has a toxic uh, sap in it, or pitch or juice, if you will. And it's one of those things that the Tongva would have mixed with bear fat and made kind of a chewing gum out of it. They wouldn't have ingested it, but they would have um, chewed it for, uh, for it. It gets the name milk vetch, and there's a story that, uh, that if the cattle and the sheep and the goats ate it, they would give more milk. But it's really a story because it's actually can be toxic to cattle in the large amounts. Oh yes, and speaking of toxic, we have jimson weed. Jimson weed grows in the sandier soils. Um, in the Malaga Dunes area, it's thriving right now. Um, it, um, it is highly toxic. Yeah, Datura. Datura has been used for by the Native Americans for hundreds of years because of its hallucinogenic uh, alkaloids that are in it. And they would use it for um, going in spirit quests. If they wanted to do that for puberty, they would give it to their, the males on a special quest. They smoked it mixed with other tobaccos that made them very drowsy or sleepy. And it gets its name Jimson weed as um, a slurred version of Jamestown weed. In the, there's a story that goes that the Native American, this would be Jamestown, Virginia, in the colonies that the British were trying to set up down there, that they, that the, they were pushing out um, the Native Americans. And so in the evenings, the Native Americans would give them some of the jimson weed to mix in their tobaccos to chew. They would tell them they could, they could grind it up and eat it. And then the, the, the British would become very sleepy, groggy, um, kind of in a, a, a euphoric state. And the Native Americans then would raid their camps or their little colony areas and escape. Uh, today, people do harvest it. They think that it's a good smoking uh, material, but it is very toxic and it can actually be lethal. It produces a pod that looks very similar to um, the wild cucumber. And it's like warning you to leave it alone with all the prickles that it has on it. Another plant that is toxic, can be toxic, but um, we, we see a lot of in Palos Verdes is the tree tobacco. Uh, we've got it growing along the bluff, um, along the fence line, as you look over the ocean there at, at Point Vicente, um, right near the native plant garden. It is actually was introduced 
uh, in the late 1500s in, uh, to California by the Spanish who gave it to the Indians who or the Native Americans who used it as a smoking material mixed with other leaves that they would uh, roll up and smoke. Um, it has nicotine in it. And the nicotine that's in the nectar in the tube flowers is very attractive to hummingbirds. So in the springtime when this is blooming, you will find a lot of hummingbirds around it. Actually, you can find hummingbirds around it at this time of year uh, on the bluffs. Occasionally one will come to check out those tubes. Problem with the, with the hummingbirds, they get addicted to it and then that's the only thing they feed on is the, the nectar out of these plants. And it's better if they have some insects and feed on other nectars as well. But they, this plant is taken looking in the canyon there right below the native plant garden in Lanata Bay and it is thriving. And uh, we have my last little plant are, is one of our late bloomers. This is a cliff aster with the honeybee on it. Um, the cliff asters are rock stars grow along the edges of the rocky areas in, in Palos Verdes, but this one has actually taken uh, seed and is growing in the native plant garden um, in some of the uh, rockier or more hard soil that it seems to like. Um, the seed head has multiple actual multiple little flowers in it to, to form the, the blossoms. And it's very attractive to butterflies and the honeybees. And I put this honeybee in here. Um, this is a project that um, Diane Robinson had going with pollinators and we used the native plant garden there at Lanata Bay for it. And we got this picture of this honeybee and when we blew it up, sure enough, the honeybee has um, its little, what we call, what they call these little areas are pollen baskets. And it's actually the, the hairs on the back legs or the lowest set of legs have enough hairs and they're very bristly. And the bee gets the pollen all over its feelers and its front legs and its hair on its body. And it will use its middle legs that have kind of a hook on them to get the pollen off the feelers and the other parts of its body. And then it pushes it down into the hairs on these back legs like a basket. And it just compacts it. It also sticks in there because with this pollen, the bee has actually been getting some of the nectar out of the plant. So it's made this sticky pollen stuff. And when it's completely full of pollen, very heavy, then it will fly to its, um, where its nesting area and deposit that pollen, that sticky pollen in the honeycomb, probably a, a treat for the queen bee. Anyway, these are European hunting bees. These are, this particular one is not our native bee, but all the bees would do this same kind of thing. So thank you, Diane. And I wanna thank um, John Nieto, Yvetta Williams, Holly Gray, Tom, my husband for his photography, um, for your, information and all the goodies. And at the very bottom of my picture, this is Voyager. And he's one of our new native, native plant visitors that comes to Point Vicente once in a while. And I thank you. And questions or comments? And if um, nobody has any questions, I will get off of this so I can um, see you all. Sue Walsh. Yes, ma'am. This is Susan Allaward. I have been noticing a plant that is blooming like nuts at Point Vicente. It's got a yellow uh, flower to it. Do you have it on your pic? Can you show me the picture on your phone? I've got off of my screen share now. Okay, just a minute. Picture on my phone. Yes, it's probably Coast Golden Bush. And yes, that's another one of the late bloomers that's blooming right now. Bright orangey yellow flowers. And um, it, it, there's, you can look at it. Uh, it has um, let's, probably lots of insects attracted to it. And yes, bees and bugs at this time of year. But it's one of, there's three late bloomers that we have 
you know, our, our area that are the, um, the cliff aster, that uh, coast golden bush, and our California fuchsia is blooming right now, that with the real pretty red tube-shaped flowers. Oh, this is Adela. I noticed that the, uh, this is the first year I noticed there's a fragrance to the coast golden bush, to the yes. flower. Yes, and that, that fragrance is actually on the leaves of the coast golden bush. And that's to attract insects and bees and butterflies as well. Mm, thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs>